Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first talk of the day, which is very appropriately about your child's first school. My name is Kay King. I run, I'm the principal of Young England Kindergarten, which is a family-run nursery school just down the road from here in Pimlico. Nursery education is your child's first run on the education ladder and sometimes gets forgotten in the planning. As it forms the foundation on which their entire education is built, it is very important. Starting school is the beginning of a new adventure, though maybe spare a thought with a little new girl who arrived on her second day at school and turned accusingly to her mother and said, but I've been to school. <laughs> anyway, only another 16 years to go. It should be a gentle introduction to school, preparing them for the next step while giving them self-confidence, independence, and a thirst for knowledge. I'm going to talk briefly about some pointers that I hope you may find helpful when choosing a nursery school and also how to register your child. As most nursery schools are not very big, it's advisable to register your child early, ideally from birth if you want to be at the top of the waiting list. You can often print off the registration form from the school's website, but I would strongly recommend that it is followed up as soon as possible by a visit. Nursery schools, unlike the next stage on, are not selective. They operate on a first-come, first-served basis, but with priority given to siblings, and in the cases like us who've been around for a long time, to old boys and old girls' children. Most nursery schools accept children from around two years old, and they will then move on to their next school in the September following their fourth birthday. You need to remember that if your child's birthday is in August, then they'll always be very, be very young in their academic year. And if their birth is in September, they'll be very old. As a country, we're extremely unusual in starting school so young. And unfortunately, although there is currently a lot of discussion about these summer babies having the option to be held back a year, at present, very few pre-prep prep, primary schools are willing to allow them to do this. So if you're planning to have a baby and you want your baby to be born to be old today, yeah, they'll have a winter baby born between September and January, but you can't send them back. <laughs> Actually, this gap between the summer and winter baby closes all the time as they get older, and it, and it is, become, um, is particularly obvious at this tender age. Some nursery schools, like the prep schools, will have a September only intake. Some will have a September and January intake and do, like us, have a termly intake. This is an important factor when you register, as at this young age, only a few months can make a huge difference in their development, hence us having an intake in September and January and April. It's also worth looking at the way in which your child will be introduced to school. It's a huge step to be left on your own for the first time, and it needs to be sympathetically and carefully handled. We find that it works well to start the two-year-olds in a smaller group with fewer sessions a week and then gradually build up to five sessions a week when they turn three and then in their last academic year have the option of bringing a packed lunch and staying for a few days until three o'clock. In this way, you're gradually being introduced to what it will be like when you move on to big school. Preparation is what it's all about. These are some ideas of what to look for when you visit a nursery school. Are the children happily and constructively engaged? Someone once commented that young England has organised chaos, and I actually think it's a rather good description of what to look for. It shouldn't be silent and regimented. Are the staff working well as a team? What are their qualifications, and how, how long do they generally remain at the school? What's the teacher-to-child ratio? Legally, it's one adult to four children under three years and one to eight over three years. Is there adequate and easily accessible outdoor space? Is there a good mix of traditional, traditional and contemporary equipment, from climbing frames and construction kits to computers and interactive whiteboards? Is there a varied curriculum, including outings, music, drama, and maybe peripatetic teachers to introduce things like languages, football, tennis, and what are the schools that the nurseries feed to? When you visit a nursery school, you may want to discuss the next step in your child's education, what we call going to big school. 
At this early stage, we obviously won't know what school will suit your child, and I always suggest to parents that they register at a variety of different schools, taking into consideration size, so a big school, a small school, maybe a single sex school, maybe a co-ed school, as well as obviously considering location. Although this will involve quite a lot of form filling and registration fee paying, it really is worth the time and money in the long run. Getting your child's name onto a waiting list will enable you to have choices. And although nearly all prep schools will assess their, child, their children before offering a place, they will close their lists even for assessment purposes. They can't be assessing a thousand children. Your child will start their prep school the September term after they turn four. And as I said, nearly all prep schools now have some form of assessment before offering a place. The boys and co-ed schools around here generally assess in October, November, and the girls' schools in January, February. Every school has a slightly different way of assessing. There are no rules. Some schools ask for a written report from the nursery. Some don't. Some schools invite the parents to stay with the child. Some don't. The child may be asked to spend the whole morning at the school, or just a short time being observed as part of a group, or sometimes just an individual chat with the child. Basically, every school is looking for children that will suit their particular environment, but the very varied process does make it sound quite complicated. They are not expecting your child to be reading, writing and doing long division age three. They're looking for children that enjoy learning, retain knowledge, and show signs of being in, uh, independent and confident. It can be a highly stressful time for parents, but the children generally regard it as a big adventure. It is important not to do too many assessments, or the child just gets fed up. And I've heard children say to me, uh, say to their parents, I just want to stay at Young England. The nursery school's job should be to help and guide you through the whole process. Following the assessments, you will hear back from the schools and then you want to may, may want to discuss your options further. But at this point, please don't say to your child, which school would you like to go to, darling? As their decision will probably be based on what the colour of the uniform was or what they were having for lunch. If you're considering privately educating your child, then it's quite possibly one of the biggest investments you'll make. It's also one of the greatest gifts that you can give to your child. Education is so important right from the start, so do book early to avoid disappointment. And remember, nursery school starts only a couple of years after your child is born. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me at the back? There's a lot of noise coming up from the side. You can. Fantastic. Um, well, I am in my 24th year as a headmaster in London, so I spend all of my time uh, leading schools in London. So hopefully that will give me an idea to, to support what Kay has just said in terms of your children's journey through the independent sector within this great city of ours. Um, the nursery school process is hugely important to me as a head of a prep school and a pre-prep school. Um, touching on the assessment into our schools, it's very important for me to see the children as they come through. Uh, making that, that step from nursery into pre-prep. But as a, as a prep head, I'm not looking to see you know, whether they can go shopping within a classroom and, and get the right change, or whether they can draw five, five fingers on a hand. That's not what's important to me. What's important to me is just seeing how, how the inter they interact with each other, seeing what sorts of character they have. And indeed, if you have a son or daughter who's very shy or very quiet and might not do particularly well in, a, in an alien setting with 10 new children they don't know, uh, we'll, we'll invite you back again as an individual and just see them on their own. So I think actually lots of prep schools are far more, far more accommodating perhaps than you might think they would be because it's so important to make the right choice and to, to, to get the right fit into our schools and for you as parents to have that assurance as well. Um, so moving from nursery into pre-prep. The pre-prep entry process is, should be as smooth as possible. And as Kay said, I think as parents we can become very anxious about that transition. And, and why wouldn't we? I was, I have four children, but nevertheless, I still went through that process, process of anxiety. Uh, and I think we become so anxious because we talk to our friends who are going through it, or perhaps friends who've had children who've gone through a couple of years before, uh, and they talk about the, the stresses involved, and, 
really, I think you should try and separate yourself as much as you can from, from the dinner, dinner table gossip that goes on and all of that, because that's what fuels the anxiety. Step away from it, look purely at your son or daughter, see who they are, what's their character, what do you like, what do you like, because often they will like the same thing. And if you put all those things into it and visit the school, then I think you'll probably make the right choice in the end. Um, but pre preps have a variety of assessment means, and it's very important that you, I think, get in touch with each pre prep and talk to them beforehand about what they are looking for for the children in their school. And if you have that knowledge, I think you will whittle down the very largest, perhaps, you start with to a more manageable one going into that at that, at that time. But once in the pre prep, that's when the train that you're on begins to pick up speed uh, as it hurtles towards perhaps exit at 7 plus or 8 plus or 11 plus or 11 plus pre-tests or common entrance at 13 plus in June or scholarships in April or May or 13 plus London Day exams in January, February. Uh, there's quite a minefield of exams to look forward to uh, and to get your head around. So I'll touch on, on those briefly this morning, uh, but I doubt I doubt I have time to really to, to give to you a clear, clear picture of it. So once you're in the pre-prep, the one person who should lead you through all of those transitional phases is the head of that school. Um, but in a pre-prep, 7 plus and 8 plus are the natural exit points. Um, and the 7 plus system has been growing over the last five to 10 years, perhaps. So if you join a pre-prep school, be aware that your, your sons, and it's usually sons, can jump off at seven plus or eight plus via English, maths, and sometimes reasoning exams, which consist of verbal and non-verbal reasoning. Eight plus is exactly the same in terms of components, but one year later. So for the summer birthdays, which Kay touched upon, that could be a better time to exit the school. And if you do have a son or daughter that was born, I would suggest June, July, certainly August, do. Do, do watch their development as, as they're going through the first few years of school. And actually, unlike Kay, I think that if you do have a summer birthday, or your child has a summer birthday, uh, that can be a significant factor all the way through at, at 7 plus, 11 plus, 13 plus, even GCSE and A level. Uh, there are many, many stories I could tell you of old boys and girls of mine who did have summer birthdays who didn't really feel they'd got on top of that until they'd left school and went to university when suddenly they were in a much, much, much wider pool than they were in their school educational journey. So I think the important thing is to, to be very conscious and aware and in touch with how your children are developing. And again, talking to the head about that where summer birthdays are concerned. The next step would be 11 plus, and this has become a little bit more complicated or involved over the last few years. Now, for girls, girls leave us at 11 plus and can sit exams for a variety of day schools and boarding schools. And that will either be a straight entrance exam or it'll be a precursor to another exam in the summer. Uh, but the 11 plus components of English, maths and reasoning again are the key factors. So. I would suggest as you're going through, of course, look at the breadth of the curriculum and see how your children are developing. But those three components become very important as, as the boys and girls hit 11 plus. And for many more boys now, there's a pre-test system which has grown up over the last few years. And more and more schools every year, senior schools, are adopting the pre-test when the children are 11. Why? Because they have so many boys and girls sitting for them through the traditional common entrance exam at 13 plus, they, they need to whittle and thin numbers at 11 uh, to, to make it more, I think, a, a better, better system really all round. And as parents, it gives you a good two years perhaps to reroute if you were headed for school X at 13 plus, uh, but when there were 11, the pre-test said no, uh, then you have two years to find an alternative. And the pre-test is a very good system actually. It allows us as a prep school to dovetail what we're doing and to prepare your boys and girls, I think, in maths and English, quite simply, rather than eight subjects at 13, and to really focus on that part of the process. Interviews also come into play at that point. 
Interviews are very important. Uh, they give the school the opportunity to see your sons and daughters, to find out a little bit more about them. Every senior school head I know uh, would stress, and I will do the same, that you shouldn't have your children tutored uh, for interviews. Um, I do a lot of mock interviews with prep schools within London, and it's absolutely apparent the boys and girls who've been coached or tutored for that process. They are very robotic. They come out with phrases and sentences which do not sit comfortably with them. Uh, and it's really hard actually to see what the real child is like. Whereas within that process, if there's a boy or girl who's not been tutored, they absolutely shine. Uh, and they can say the most ridiculously beautiful thing that an 11 year old might say. And that leaps out. And as a head, I would always go for that one than the one who was talking about the complexities of the US election of, of last week. So, really, I think again, just, just let them develop at their own pace and they'll get through that interview process. Following a pretest, you will receive one of three letters. One will be an offer, subject to common entrance when they're 13, one will be a waiting list place, and the other one would be uh, a rejection saying, sadly, they, they didn't make it through this time. Uh, perhaps they'll invite you back again, or, or perhaps not. The offer is fairly straightforward in as much as if your son or daughter is offered a place after the pretest subject to common entrance in two years time, usually that will hold true and your son or daughter will progress and successfully navigate to common entrance and join the school. So the pretest has become more important almost than the 13 plus common entrance exams. The waiting list letter is, is harder, especially where boarding schools are concerned. Uh, the head of the, pre, the, of the prep school will have to keep in touch with the senior school who've offered a waiting list with regular updates as to how that particular child is developing. Are they progressing as the head thinks they should? Will they reach the required standard of the senior school who've offered a waiting list place? And it becomes very difficult for you as parents because you have to then start running two schools alongside each other. The waiting list, if that's your first choice, and the school perhaps that might come true if the waiting list doesn't work out in the end. And as a parent, I think that becomes difficult. And for the child, it becomes difficult because both you and your son or daughter has to invest time in the other school, especially if it's boarding schools, meeting house masters, getting all of that set up uh, when in their last year, perhaps, suddenly an offer will come through and you do you reroute? Do you suddenly move away from the school you've established all of these relationships with to what was your first choice? So I think if you are offered a place on a waiting list, then the first thing to do is to talk to the prep school head and really sit down and look at your son or daughter and think, is this the right school for them when they're 13 plus? And actually, it may be a good time to, to think, well, perhaps it's not going to be the right one after all. Choosing a senior school, a lot goes into that process. Um, I think every registrar you see, if you're lucky enough to hear the heads talk if they're involved in the process, will describe their schools in very similar ways. Um, they'll all talk about breadth of curriculum, they'll all talk about extracurricular, they'll all talk about value added, they'll all talk about their wonderful fields, their wonderful facilities, uh, and after a while, you'll have visited two, three, four, five, six, and you'll find it very difficult to actually sit down and think, well, actually, which school, which school is the best one? Um, and for me, it comes down to very simple, simple things. Uh, as I said at the beginning, your children will take a lot of what you are like into their educational life. So if you feel at home within a senior school, if you feel that the environment in this school is somewhere you would like to have been, and you could have accessed. Uh, that for me is very telling. Think about the head and what he or she is saying. If you believe what they're saying and actually you think that is absolutely right for my son or daughter's education, their values are the same as ours, uh, then again, I would think that's a really good choice to make. Don't listen to your friend's experiences. Don't take too much regard 
to what you read. It's got to be a choice that comes, I think, from your own experience. So work, work on that. Look at, as Kay has said, look at the children, look at the staff, how are they interacting? If that relationship, in my opinion, is warm, is relaxed, and there's a good dialogue going both ways, and the boys and girls are not completely quiet and drilled and doing nothing but looking at their, their books or their tablets or whatever it is, that relationship for me is very important. And I think for a successful school, it's key. So, and that's something you can see on your tour rather than listening to what is being said about the school. If you have an opportunity to talk to pupils in the school, that can be very telling. Uh, but also, a word of caution, you know, boys who take you on tours or girls who take you on tours at 11 or 13 or 15 or 18 um, are still very young, so you have to take that with a pinch of salt. But nevertheless, they should be able to give you quite a candid description of the school and I think of their time in the school and how they felt about it. And often you can get fantastic answers from them, um, and very honest and true ones, which wouldn't, shouldn't necessarily sway you away from it, but will just give you a good idea about the school. At Senior School Choice, do talk to your children uh, about it, especially if they're going to boarding school. I think there could be nothing worse than a boarding school child when they're going through their teen years or 16 or 17 or 18 turning around and saying well you chose the school for me I never wanted to come here um, so involve them in the choice and I, I advise our parents to try and whittle down the list of schools to three four or five perhaps that they would be very happy with equally happy with uh, and then bring the children in to make a choice from that group and that way hopefully both both are satisfied you've you've reduced it to five schools you like they can then get involved with that final choice. And also be aware that at the time of school selection and school choice, your, your sons or daughters may well say, well, my best friend is going, or three or four boys are going, or three or four girls are going. The reality is, when they get to senior school, they tend to, they tend to find new friends and, and not drift apart, but nevertheless, they, they, they create a new existence for themselves. So I think, that, that to me is not hugely important. If you find a school and nobody else is going there from your, your son or daughter's year group, stick with it because it will work out. And especially where boarding is concerned, because in boarding schools, the schools tend to try and split up everybody who's come from the same school into different houses anyway, just for that, for that very reason. So the educational journey within the independent system where exams and, and joining new schools is concerned, is one that undulates, it goes up and down. And in many ways, I think it would be much better if you could join a school at nursery level and go all the way through to 18 without having to, to jump off and make a change. It would be smart, far, far smoother. Because the one criticism I would have of our system is that we do have to keep chopping and changing. And with every change, there's a push towards the exams, and when the children arrive, everything slows down a bit, well, we will regroup. There's a push towards the next one, it slows down, we regroup, we push on to GCSE. Uh, but if we could have a system where it was continually through from nursery to 16 or 18, I think the educational benefit to the children would be immense. Uh, and it might be interesting, we'll see how, how things develop as we go through with that. But, but do take your time with school choices. As Kay said, this is, an enormous, an enormous investment if you're just beginning the journey uh, that you're making. But it is one that I truly believe is worth every penny. And I think if you talk to all of the heads and schools who are sitting behind you and talking to parents, they would say the same thing. Independent education can bring your children so much, so much in terms of choice and experience and values. And it really is worth that, every single penny. And it's the one thing, as you know, that you, you, your children will never lose. The investment you make in their education will stay with them throughout their entire life, more than anything else you can give them. So, so make the choices carefully, but uh, do remember that it really is a very worthwhile choice, I think, uh, and one worth looking into.